My name is Terry. I'm one of the pastors here. And if it's your first time, welcome. We're so excited that you decided to be a part of our church, whether you're on the floor, in the balcony, or if you're tuning in online. We're excited as we start this brand new message series entitled Broken Images. And isn't it true that um, in life we, we have mountaintops and we have valleys? Isn't that true? And uh, if, if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, um, isn't it true that we also kind of follow a little bit of a pattern where when we face difficulties or we face challenges, many times we will look throughout biblical history and we will attach ourselves to one of our biblical heroes of the faith. And so, you know, when we sang just a little bit ago about David the shepherd boy who, who slayed Goliath, and it, we, we said in that next verse that we face our giants. We might not face Goliath, but we face our own giants. Isn't it true that some of us, when we face an insurmountable pressure or uh, obstacle in, face, in our front of our face, we often think of David, and we say, well, David slayed Goliath, and so if he can do it, I can do it. And, and many times we look back, and, and they become our heroes, and, and we really, really look at the highlights that they bring. But if you've studied Scripture long enough, you also begin to realize that it was not always roses with our biblical heroes, that many times we see that, yes, they had the highest of highs, but they also had the lowest of lows. And I know some of you are like, no, 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 my biblical heroes, they were always perfect. They did always amazing things. Well, that's not necessarily true. And over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to choose four of our biblical heroes, and we're going to take a look at their highlights, but we're going to take a look at the fact that they were not perfect, and that God uses broken people for his perfect plan. And we're going to look at the broken images that we can learn and glean from. In order to set this off, I don't know if a lot of you are, are sports fans, but last week I was in Charleston. Thank you to Pastor Aaron for filling in on Sunday. We were in town for a baseball tournament, and that evening we watched uh, the Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals. I spent 30 years in South Florida, so I was there when the Miami Heat were uh, you know, incorporated and began as a team, so uh, I really kind of captured that team, loved that team, and so I, I was all in, and we were watching them face the Boston Celtics, and if you watch that game, um, you, you begin to, to resonate with what it means to, to be a Christian. Because I remember sitting there and I was with my buddy and I was just like, all right, they got to start off strong. The Miami Heat, they got to they do it. They got to go out strong. And the first quarter, they were lousy. And I remember sitting there going, oh, man, that's, that's not good. This is not good. And then we go to the second quarter. All right, we're, we're going to get on it. We're going to score some points. And the second quarter was just the same. Every time we'd score a point, they'd score two. And we just would fall further behind. And we got to the third quarter. All right, third quarter, here we go. We're going to climb this mountain. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And all of a sudden, we went up. And again, they would score after we would score. And so we were down by a lot. In the fourth quarter, all right, fourth quarter, here it is. And my buddy's looking at me and just like, you are going up and down and up and down. This is ridiculous. I'm like, all right, we got to do this. We got to do this. And we get down and we're getting to about four minutes left and we're, we're just blowing it. And so I'm just like, oh gosh, I can't believe, oh, why is he shooting the ball? Oh, we're terrible. Oh, we don't deserve to win. They're much better than we are. This is awful. This is terrible. We should, we got to, what are our free agents for the next season? And, and my buddy's looking at me, the game's not even over. I'm like, oh, it's over. It's over. So then we all of a sudden get to about two minutes out. And if you watch the game, all of a sudden the Miami Heat, they would score one and, or two and, or three and they wouldn't score. And then we'd gain up a little bit. And so I'm sitting there on the couch and I'm watching and I'm like, well, that's interesting. All right, oh, that was a good shot. The way to go. All right. Oh, they missed. Oh, oh, I got a, oh we got it down to six. Okay. All right. Let's go. No, we, ain't got a, we ain't got a chance. So it's only a minute like 40 left. And I'm like, oh, I got it down to four. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. Like, and then all of a sudden, with about a minute left, the Heat scored and got within two points. And I was like, two points. Oh my gosh. We haven't been to two points. We're amazing. He, did you see that? He's incredible. He's awesome. Look at him. My buddy's looking at me just shaking his head. It just, and then all of a sudden, Jimmy Butler, he gets the ball, and they block the shot. They're down by two. And Jimmy Butler, I'm like, oh, my gosh, if we score, we're going to tie the game. We're going to win the game. This is, we're at 40 seconds left. This is incredible. Jimmy Butler, he's driving down the court. He stops at the three-point line. Oh, my gosh, he's going to shoot it. It's going to go in. The crowd's going nuts. Everything's going incredible. And all of a sudden, he stops. He jumps. And you ever have that moment where everything is in slow motion? And I can picture that ball is going to go up. It's going to sink. The crowd's going to go nuts. It's deafening. The Heat are going to take the lead. Boston is down. I mean, they're, they're not God's team. And so they're just going to be down there. And it's going to be incredible. And so all of a sudden, Jimmy Butler gets there. He jumps up. He shoots. It goes. And I'm like, it's going to go in. They're going to take the lead. And it goes clank. Hits off the backboard. Heat lose. I look at my buddy. It's like, oh, we stink. We're terrible. It's awful. And he looks at me and he goes, what is it with you? 
He says, you know, one minute he's great, the next minute you're just crucifying him. I'm like, come on. I'm like, oh. I was like, ah, it's being a sports fan. But isn't it true in life, it's not just about sports fans? Isn't it true that if you're a follower of Jesus, we do the same thing? We have those mountaintop experiences. God, you're awesome. God, you're incredible. Did you see God do that? God is so faithful. Did you see God provide? I can never doubt God. He's awesome. And then two months later, God, where are you? God, why'd you do that? God, I just don't understand you. God, do you see what's going on here? How could you let this happen, God? Where are you, God? And we go up and we go down and we go up and we go down and we're just like those sports fans. Well, if that's you, then today we're gonna take a look at one of the most amazing prophets, if not the most incredible prophet in all biblical history, and his name's Elijah. But in order to kick this off, I want to share a statement with you, and you can hold on to it until the end. And it goes like this. When you stop looking for the wonders during periods of wavering, you will hear his whisper. I'm going to say it one more time. When you stop looking for the wonders during periods of wavering, you'll hear his whisper. In order to share the truth of that statement, we're going to take a look at Elijah. If you don't know much about Elijah, Elijah was God-like. He performed miracles. He did incredible feats that are uncomparable to anybody else. And so some of you are like, man, Elijah, he was only great. When did he ever have a downturn? Well, we're going to see in just a second. But we're going to start with the mountaintop. Because I love this story. And if you've read the Bible or if you've been a, a, a Christian for a long time, you know this story. All of a sudden, there was a very evil king. In fact, Scripture tells us that it was probably the most evil king of all, and his name was Ahab. And Ahab was leading the Israelites astray. And he was leading them to worship other gods. And one of the most famous gods throughout biblical history that the people believed in was the god of Baal. And the god of Baal was the god of thunder, the god of lightning, the god of rain. Makes sense, right? We can see the thunder, we can see the clouds, we can see the rain, there must be a god associated with it. So the people who were uneducated at the time believed in the god of Baal. And so this king led the Israelites to worship the god of Baal. And the prophet Elijah was the last standing prophet of God. Lonely place. And all of a sudden, Elijah is going to encounter and he's going to do a smackdown, a battle with those that believe in Baal. And they're going to send to Mount Carmel, and this is where we pick up the story of the battle between Elijah and the false prophets of Baal. Let's take a look at 1 Kings 18 20. It says, So Ahab, the evil king, summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver? hobbling between two different opinions. If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now do this for me. I want you to bring me two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. Then I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but I will not set fire to it also. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the one and only true God. And then all the people agreed. And so you see this smackdown. It's amazing. You have a competition up here. Who is the true God? Now, this occurred on Mount Carmel. If, you're, if you know anything about biblical history, Mount Carmel sits right next to the Valley of Armageddon. It's called the Jezreel Valley. It's in Israel today. It's the magnificent when you stand on a mountain and look at this huge valley. If you ever wonder how so many people are going to fit in that valley, you begin to realize when you stand there. But to give you a little bit of background of this, Mount Carmel sits on one side, and then further down the Jezreel Valley, there is a place called Tel Megiddo. In fact, I have a picture of it here. This is Tel Megiddo. And Tel Megiddo, you see this structure, it is this mound, this hill that is built up, and it's right next to that valley. That's the Valley of Armageddon. Oversee it. You see how large it is. And the reason why they call it a tell is, is a tell throughout history is landmass that continues to rise. Now, you might say, well, Terry, how is that possible? Is it climate change? No. Let me tell you why it rises. It's because throughout history, there are battles, there are kingdoms, there are buildings that are built. And when kingdoms are destroyed and castles are destroyed, then it raises the rubble on the ground. 
And then all of a sudden, what do you do? You raise the rubble, you flatten it, and then you build on top of it. And over the years, these tells that are on the side begin to rise, begin to rise, begin to rise, and they almost look like mountains. Well, Tel Megiddo is on that one side. The reason why I bring this up is, is Tel Megiddo is one of the oldest excavated sites in biblical history. It is from the Canaanite area. It is thousands of years old, B.C., And if you came to Israel with me later in the year, you'd be able to walk on this. And one of the things that you would see, which is absolutely fascinating, is you would see the area in which they worshipped. Now, here's the problem with Tel Megiddo. Tel Megiddo was known at times of not following God. And the sacrificial system in the area in which they built was not necessary for animals built to worship God. Instead, It was meant for different types of sacrifice. And here's a picture of actually the excavated sacrificial place. You see the round circle. You see the stones that form the sacrificial place. Well, the prophets of Baal and the individuals that believed in false gods, they also believed that one of the ways in which you honor these gods is by sacrificing not animals, but sacrificing people and children. And so they would use this place right here, and they would sacrifice children on it to be able to gain favor with their false gods. And the reason why I tell you this is is because you need to understand the type of prophets and the type of individuals that Elijah was facing against. They were calling people to kill children. They were calling people to sacrifice human beings, to do things that would be despicable to God because God created you and I in his own image. And so Elijah is on this mountaintop and he faces these type of prophets. And we pick up the story in verse 25. It says, then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, all right, you go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call in the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls, they placed it on the altar, and they called on the name of Baal, don't miss this, from morning until noontime, shouting, oh, Baal, answer us. Now, I just got to tell you something. You got to put yourself in that shoes. You're sitting there, you're on the top of Mount Carmel, Early in the morning, five, six in the morning, the sun is rising in Israel, okay? So you're talking about five or six hours of people shouting at the top of their lungs, oh, Baal, answer, oh, Baal, answer. Now, if you or I, if we're bringing it to 21st century, you know, our attention limit is about 20 minutes, if that. Some of you, it's like 10 seconds. Some of you need to elbow someone to wake them up already, okay? So you can imagine if you're sitting there and you're watching these people scream out loud for hours. At some point, I'd be up there, I'm like, okay, give it a rest, guys, it's not working. But they did this until noon time, yelling and yelling. And we continue, and it says, but there was no reply of any kind. Then they double down. I love this. Because finally around noon time, they're like, okay, this is not working. Let's change our strategy. So they start dancing, hobbling around the altar that they had made. If you ever wonder why you should read the Bible, I love the next few sentences. This should intrigue you to the highest. About noon time, Elijah began mocking them. You got to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he's a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming, or maybe he's even relieving himself. If you didn't think the Bible was incredible, that's in the Bible. Continuing on, or maybe he's away on a trip, or he's asleep and needs to be wakened. So they shouted louder, and they followed their normal custom as they cut themselves with knives and with swords until blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, and no response. You know, it's incredible. We see this and we begin to see how foolish the prophets of Baal are. And if if you're like me, maybe you're not a Christian in this room and maybe you're just watching, you're like, you know, how in the world did those people continue to do this? How How did they look so foolish? I mean, didn't they realize that throughout the whole day that they got it wrong? Don't they realize who God is? And and I like you, when I read that story, I'm like, you these people. But isn't it true that we act just as foolish as they do sometimes? Some of you are like, no, Terry, I don't do that. Absolutely not. Oh, really? How many of you ever played the, the game Hunt and Peck? It's a very famous Christian game. In fact, I think most of us in this room have probably played it. You ever played Hunt and Peck? You remember maybe when you were a young single adult, maybe when you were dating and all of a sudden you saw the perfect lady or the perfect guy and you said, oh, I really think this is the one. I really think this is one. I really think that, I, you know, maybe, maybe this is what God has for me. And then all of a sudden you want to make sure, right? 
And so many of us, we want to make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. So we got to check with the big guy, right? And so what do we do? We say, God, I need the answer. God, I need to know if this is the right one. God, you got to speak. And, and we don't hear him. And so we just keep praying, God, I want to make sure because my parents are saying one thing, my friends are saying another thing. And then we decide, you know what? Let's go ahead and play the game hunt and peck. So then we go ahead and we grab our Bibles and we sit there and say, okay, God, here it is. This is it. The, t- the deadline's here. I need to know if this is the right person. So I'm going to open my Bible. And when I stop, I'm going to place my finger. And wherever I place my finger, that means you're speaking to me. You ever done that before? Maybe just me. But all of a sudden, many of us in this room, we sit there and we say, okay, God, I need to know if this is the right person. So here we go. Boom. And we find Mark 1450. And it says this. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Okay, God, maybe you weren't ready for that one. You weren't listening. I I rushed it. it. It's just not there. And so, God, I really, really need to know. God, I want someone who is an honorable man. I want someone that we have peaceful times. I want a harmonious home, something loving, nothing crazy. So, God, I really need you. So I'm going to flip my page, and God, whatever it is, you speak. Exodus 4, 24 and 25. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zavora took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. I don't even know what to do with that. God, we got to get serious here because time's running out, and I really need to know if this is the one. So God, I need you to tell me specifically, is this the person for me? Tell me now. Proverbs 21, 19, better to live in a desert than with an ill term, better to quarrel some wife. Well, you spoke. Now we laugh at that, don't we? But how many of us in our quiet times or how many of us in our prayer lives, we just looked and we said, surely this has to be the word from God. We do a lot of different things, right? We just want God to speak. We want to know. We want him to do what we want him to do in the moment. But here's the truth. Wonders happening according to his plan and not our purpose. God's wonders happen according to his plan, not our purpose. And I think a lot of us at times, we we struggle because we want God to be a part of what we want. And the truth is, it's his plan, not mine. And we pick up the story in verse 30 and we're going to see what ends up happening because all of a sudden the prophets of Baal look foolish And Elijah calls him out, and now it's Elijah's turn in verse 30. Here we go. It says, then Elijah called to the people, come over here. And they all crowded around him. And as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. This is not in my notes, but God really gave this to me this morning, and I just want to tell you, isn't it true that sometimes when we want to further our relationship with God, there are things that need to be repaired? And I love that Elijah, one of the first things that he does is he repairs the altar of God as a symbol to his God to say, God, this is about you. This is not about me. So then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They crowded around. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons of water. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did it as he said, and the water ran around the altar and it even filled the trench. At the usual time for the, off- the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven. And burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. And this is where all of us as Christians, we read that story and we go, Yes, ha, Elijah. Yes, He did it. Isn't He amazing? Now, I got to be honest, let me take my pastor hat off for a second, and let me just, you know, again, I've been to Mount Carmel, so I picture Mount Carmel, and I picture Elijah there, and I take my pastor hat off, and I was, if I was Elijah Terry, I'd be up on the side, and remember, I said, Elijah looked and said, come on, 
what's the matter? Your God can't hear you? Why don't you shout louder? Maybe he's relieving himself. Yeah, I'd be doing all that. And then, after I sat there and did all that, if God did what he did back then in front of me, I'd be like, ha, gotcha, gotcha. Doesn't it feel good? That's right, walk it off, walk it off. I'd be that. I'd be sitting there and I'd be like, it's amazing. Now, some of you in here say, well, Terry, wait a second. You just got done saying to us that, you know, like people are foolish and people, you know, this and that, and we shouldn't kind of, you know, look at God for, for the mountaintops, but, but wait a minute. Elijah got his moment. Elijah got his wonder. God spoke to him in the moment. It's as if Elijah said, God, now speak, and God spoke. So wait a minute. That's not fair. How come Elijah can get it and we can't? Well, remember I told you it's about his plan, not our purpose. But if you get this next statement, you can go to sleep, not just for the next 20 minutes, for the next 10 years, okay? What is that, Rumpelstiltskin? You ever see that? Yeah, you can be Rumpelstiltskin. I don't know if I have the right analogy there, but you get my point. And so here's the point, and here's the truth. God can do whatever he wants because he's sovereign. God can do whatever he wants. He's God. He is God and I'm not. And I think in our lives, we get caught into the trap of always wanting to call on the wonder of God to prove himself. We always want God. We always want to make sure we have our security. God, I need you to show me. God, I need you to show me. God, I need you to be here. And we are constantly calling on God to show himself in the wonders. When the truth is, he doesn't because he's sovereign. God does not need to prove himself with a wonder because he already did. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the oceans, the waters, the streams, the rivers, the land, the animals. God breathed and created man and created woman. God performed miracles, and then God called Jesus Christ to give himself up freely as a sacrifice for you and I. And then God did one of the things that we forget all the time is that Jesus beat death for us. And so when we sit there and say, God, I need you to perform a wonder, he already did. And so for many of us in this room today, our word to God is, God, forgive me. You are incredible. And I trust you. No matter what, I trust you. And one of the great things is, is that we have that mountaintop experience, and Elijah has that mountaintop experience, but... I told you at the beginning of this message that isn't it true that many of us, we have our highs and lows. And if I was Elijah, I'd be on my mountaintop. There'd be nothing that could knock me down. But do you know one of the most amazing prophets in the history of our world, he went from the top of the mountain to the lowest valley in a matter of just a short amount of time. You don't believe me? Let's pick it up. This is 1 Kings 19, 1 through 3. It says when Ahab, by the way, he's that evil king, remember, and all of his prophets... Elijah and all the Israelites, they killed all the prophets of Baal. Remember I said they were were evil and they were turning the Israelites against God, so they killed the prophets of Baal and Ahab got home. Go back. Go back, please. Thank you. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything. And Jezebel was one of the wickedest women of all history. And he told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the way that he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods, now you notice this, little g, right? May the gods of Baal, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Ooh. Jezebel says, all right, yeah, I know the god of Baal who was just proven false and all the prophets that we had that were lying and you just killed them, but I'm gonna tell you, Elijah, that by that god who you already proved as false, By him, I swear that you're going to be dead tomorrow. Now, if I'm Elijah and I get that message, here's what I'm doing. Ooh, ooh, I'm scared. I mean, what are you doing? You're calling on the God that I just proved false. You don't scare me. I got the God of the universe. I mean, please, I ain't got time for this. But I want you to see Elijah, Elijah who performed miracles, Elijah who knew God. Elijah, one of the best prophets in the world. I want you to see his response. Elijah was afraid. And he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. If you ever wonder in life how 
people can turn so quickly. You need no look no farther than the example of Elijah. There's no logical reason why Elijah would run. None whatsoever. He just did the most amazing thing, and he's running from a God who he just proved was false. So why did it happen? I think it's because to show you and I that in our humanity, we're going to struggle. In our humanity, we're going to be imperfect at times. And maybe there's a lesson to be learned within the struggle. Maybe within the tension, those are the moments where we need to tune in more so we can learn a lesson. But if you're like me, I'm Italian, and I can swing in my emotions. And isn't it true that when we wear our emotions on our sleeves, we can swing from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows in a singular moment? And if that's you, I want you to watch what happens between Elijah and God. You see, it's really easy to learn things from the positive. But I think it's more challenging but more powerful to learn from the negative. So let's see as Elijah is running now. Let's see what God wants to speak to you and I. 1 Kings 19.9 says this. Then Elijah came to a cave where he spent the night. He ran. He hid. And then the Lord spoke to Elijah. The Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So I have the same question to ask you in the balcony on the floor watching online. Have you been running from God? Have you been doubting God? Have you been frustrated with God? Have you been angry with God? Have you been wondering why your plan isn't working out? If that's you, you're like Elijah. And the question that God is going to speak into your heart right now, if he hasn't already, is, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You worshiped me on the mountaintop. Why are you doubting me now? And let's watch Elijah's reply. Elijah then said this, I have zealously served God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I love this because you see the humanity of Elijah. God, I've been working hard. God, I've sat there. I've done what you told me to do, and I'm the only one left. And they've torn down your altars. They've done all the things that I'm trying to fight against. In other words, God, you've got to throw me a bone here. I'm tired of fighting. You know, every night I have to worry, and now Jezebel wants to kill me. And so every night I'm sitting there wondering if this is my last breath. God, I would have just liked to have lived a normal life. I would have just liked to have not had to do all this. And so, yes, I'm in a cave. Yes, I'm frustrated. Yes, I'm here. You want to know why I'm here? That's why I'm here, God. You see Elijah's humanity. But really what was happening in that moment is Elijah had a sense of loss. Elijah was battling. Why did I have to do all this for God? Why couldn't I just be in a different place? And so he was battling a loss in his life. And it's truth that negative emotion is often triggered by a sense of loss. Elijah was going to be chased to be murdered. He lost his freedom. He couldn't be a normal person. I have to run for my life. I've lost normalcy. So yes, I'm angry, God. Yes, I'm upset. And some of you in this room, you're just like Elijah. You've allowed your emotion, a sense of loss, to hold on to you. And you've been in a place where God is saying, why are you here? And here's the big question for some of you. How long will that last, Terry? How long will I be here? Well, here's the truth. The length of that emotion is determined by how we reconcile it. The answer to how long you're going to be in this place is how you reconcile with that loss. And if you're in here today and you are battling and you're holding on, you're angry, you're upset, you're hiding in a cave like Elijah did, then you've got to reconcile with loss. And here's the thing. There are many ways to reconcile lost. The problem is, is most of them are unhealthy. There's just a few that are healthy. So some of you, if you're struggling a little bit, you might be reconciling these ways. First, some of you are reconciling loss by reframing your loss. You're trying to convince yourself that the loss had little value. No big deal. No big deal. I'm all right. No big deal. And you're bitter. And you're trying to reframe it. Some of you, you're trying to reproduce it. You're lingering on it by recalling memories and pictures of the loss. 
Some of you are holding on, and you're holding on because you just don't want to let go. And the truth of the matter is, is sometimes it's hard when you lose a loved one because you just want to hold on. You don't ever want to let go. The truth is, though, is that life is going to continue to move forward. And there are seasons of loss, and there are seasons where you need to hold on, but then God still has a purpose and a plan for your life, and God's going to call you to move. So some of us, we hold on too long. Some of us try to replace it. We fill the void of the loss by finding a substitute for it. And unfortunately, a lot of times when you have a tragedy or a loss of some kind, many times the thing that you try to substitute it with is not the wisest choice. And it comes in many different forms. It's, it can come in the form of another person. It can come in the form of drugs, alcohol, bad behavior. Some of us, we do what I did when I was 15, and we reject it. We tell ourselves that nothing has changed. I'll never forget when I was at my mom's funeral and I was standing there at the memorial service and I was laughing and joking as if nothing had happened. And people were coming in all sad and they were looking at me and I tried to cheer them up. Hey, how are you? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's okay. It's okay. Everything to just reject what had happened to my life. Some of us go to an even darker place when we have a sense of loss. We recriminate it. We replace sadness with anger or hostility towards someone else. we got to find someone to blame. And do you know who the chief person that we blame is? God. God, why'd you do that? How'd you do that? I can't believe you did that. And many of us run from God because we just can't believe that the God who loves me would do such a thing. There's a couple more, though. Last negative one is we recycle it. And the way you recycle it is you try to delay the inevitable and you prolong sadness before acceptance. You just stay in the same place and you don't move because you just don't know how. And that's when you need a loved one to come alongside of you and to help you to take your steps because you're just stuck. And then finally, if you've run through any of those and say, Terry, I need to reconcile, I need to reconcile. Well, the truth is the way that you re reconcile finally in a season of loss is very simply, you need to receive it. You need to embrace the sadness for what the loss is and begin the process of healing. Recognize what you lost. You know, I tell our pastors all the time in times of tragedy and times of loss when they go to try to minister to someone, I always tell them your job is not to fix them. Your job is not to have the best scripture to be able to make them feel good in a moment. Your job is just to be there, to put your arm around them, to recognize what exactly has happened in their life, and to say, I'm so sorry. There are no words. I'm so sorry. And for some of us in this room, we have to recognize our loss for what it is. Because reconciling loss releases the grip of the past. You want to fulfill the purpose and plan that God has for you? Then you've got to learn to reconcile with loss. You've got to let go of the bitterness. And Elijah was in a cave, angry at God, after he had just performed a miracle. And so Elijah is confronted by God, and he reconciles with his loss. And let's finish the story in verse 9 through 13. It's, God says, Elijah, I want you to go and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. He went out, stood at the entrance of the cave, and a voice said once again, all right, Elijah, what are you doing here? For many of us in this room, that's the question. What are you doing here? We crave the whisper of God. And the important thing to remember is when you stop looking for the wonders during periods of wavering, you'll hear that whisper. When you recognize that he is God and I'm not, 
when you recognize that his plan is far better than mine. When you recognize this is painful, God, but the truth is you are still on the throne and you love me and you have my best plan and interest for me, God, so I'm going to trust you even though I feel so very tired and angry. And when you can find that and you can listen to the whisper of God, there is hope because hope is always found in the whisper of God. So the question for you today, are you ready to hear his voice? Are you ready to move? Are you ready to be able to complete his plan for you? Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and God, all morning long, I know that you have touched hearts and God, I can even sense in this room there are individuals that are stuck. And and so, God, I pray that you would speak into their hearts and whisper. So, God, right now, we invite you, whisper. God, I pray that we would hold on to your words, that we would apply them to our lives, that we would let go of the past and that we'd begin to fulfill the future that you have for us. We bless you today and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.